And I'm going to turn it over to the judges for their introduction. All right. Thank you very much. As our esteemed facilitator just said, we'll introduce ourselves. We'll ask you to introduce yourselves and your teacher. And then we're going to have a fun conversation. Uh, my name is Charlie Hinderleiter. I'm the Director of Government Affairs for St. Louis Realtors in St. Louis, Missouri. Um, I've taught political science at a variety of institutions. And I was once on that side of the table as a student in the We the People program. Uh, good morning or afternoon. This is Mark Simons. I'm an attorney in Reno, Nevada. And I uh, want to emphasize to you that what you're doing, you can make a wonderful living at. You get paid to do this and argue and have an understanding of the Constitution. So don't give up on it. Keep going. Good luck. Looking forward to uh, having a conversation with you as well. Bye bye. Good afternoon. I'm Karen Melton. I too am a lawyer by training. Um, I'm currently the Chief of Staff in the Inspector General's Office for the Metropolitan Transportation Authority here in New York City. Uh, previously, I was the Circuit Executive, that's the Chief Operating Officer, more or less, of the Second Circuit, and those are the states of New York, Vermont, and Connecticut, um, in which there are 13 federal courts. Um, Want to say, take a deep breath. And um, I know it's hard to relax, but we're looking forward to a great conversation. And I wish you good luck and look forward to hearing from you. Charlie, back to you. All right, students, if you'd be so kind as to introduce yourselves and your teacher. Hello, we are Unit 1 from Maine South High School. Our STEAM coaches are Andrew Trinkle and Kevin C. Hansen. I am Vasilios Lutrianakis. I'm Luke Olofsson. I'm Kenny Kim. And I'm Wilson Sitkowitz. Thank you for having us today. Fantastic. Uh, we are going to read Unit 1 question number one in its entirety. And then we will ask you uh, to go ahead and begin your prepared statement. The American war is over, but this is far from being the case with the American Revolution. To what extent, if any, did revolutionary principles influence constitution making during the founding period? What problems, if any, does the principle of consent present when creating or amending constitutions? To what extent, if any, are revolutionary principles evident in modern times? Whenever you're ready. John Adams said, the form of government which communicates ease, comfort, security, or in one word, happiness, to the greatest number of persons and to the greatest degree is the best. The goal of the founders was to secure the rights of citizens and ensure good governance. Like many revolutionary documents, thoughts on government were inherently idealistic. The patriots and founding fathers wanted a profound change in government that secured the rights of all men, unlike their previous treatment under King George. They sought for self-governance and a complete change to the constitutional government, leaving no room for a monarch in charge. Adhering to the definition of a revolution, a complete enforceable overthrow of governmental power in favor of a new system, the founders sought not just independence, but a brand new democratic republic unified under a single document, the Constitution. As Thomas Paine famously wrote in Common Sense, common sense will tell us that the power that hath endeavored to subdue us is of all others the most improper to defend us. The power, King George, was present to subdue the colonists. For example, the Quartering Act was implemented to force the colonists to house British soldiers, and the Townsend Act was created to tax the citizens' goods, including glass, tea, glass, paper, and infamously tea. Payne argued that the monarchy could not protect the colonists in times of emergency due to the 4,000 miles of water that separated them. On top of failure of being able to protect the colonists, Jefferson wrote in the Declaration of Independence, under grievance number 24, he has plundered our seas, ravaged our coasts, burnt our towns and destroyed the lives of our people. This shows that not only was there a lack of representative government, but that the monarchy purposely sought out violence as means of control. Therefore, the only option was to revolt. Our constitution making was inspired by flaws within the English system and justified by revolutionary principles. The first three articles provide the separation of powers using the fight for independence to ensure that no one power remains in control or falls corrupt. The Bill of Rights and amendment processes were written to protect civil liberties and provide the ability to listen and expand to people's concerns. For example, the First Amendment allows people to peacefully assemble, previously not allowed for fears of revolution against the Crown. The Third Amendment specifically prohibits quartering of unwanted soldiers as a response to the Quartering Act by King George. The Bill of Rights encompasses negative rights that promoted self-government for the colonists. When creating constitutions, consent creates the tension between republic and democratic ideals. It is difficult to create a set of laws based on revolutionary principles that all people agree with. 
It does seem logical that all people should agree with the Constitution because these same people fought for the revolution itself. However, this is the beautiful thing about a democratic republic. Not only is a majority needed to favor a specific legal system, but representatives can be used to use the ideas of the people. For example, in Plato's Republic, through the narration of Socrates, it states that democracy is full of variety and disorder and dispensing a sort of equality to unequaled and equaled alike. However, this democracy is a direct democracy, which the founders correctly believed to be chaotic. Right to revolt has built our constitution and is the foundation for our country and remains prevalent in the modern era. Last summer, we saw an embodiment of revolution in the Black Lives Matter movement. Incited by the death of George Floyd provided the grounds for activists to protest and riot against a system that is most improper to defend us. In many instances, our amendments and civil rights have been expanded because of protest movements. Stonewall paved the way for LGBTQ plus rights. Seneca Falls began the discussion for women's suffrage and equality. Throughout American history, these examples of activism bring us back to our foundation, revolution itself. Although inclusive and expansive, the Constitution does have its drawbacks. The United States Constitution is a much more conservative document than other state constitutions, for example. However, it is also much more realistic. Early Americans witnessed how a weak central authority could be dangerous. For example, the issue of Shays' Rebellion. The Constitution had to be practical while still sticking to the essence of America in the first place, liberty. Thank you, and we are now open for questions. I want to explore this right to revolt that you're mentioning. Now, is the right to revolt incorporate violence, destruction of personal property, deprivation of rights of others, um, and, or is it going too far and, and going past what we, the founding fathers attempted to incorporate in the single document that they put together? Are we past what was contemplated by the founding fathers or are we staying consistent with, with what's happening in current times? So I believe uh, when we're talking about revolution, we have to make the distinction between violent revolution itself and revolutionary ideas. In the modern eras, the uh, most common idea of revolutionary ideas is seen in protest as we've seen, uh, as we saw last summer. However, in order for an actual violent revolution to take place, we believe with the steps the founders took, uh, the only way to have a violent revolution would be for the institution of voting to be completely dismantled. And this is because the institution of voting uh, represents a, a democratically elected uh, government where minority rights are protected by majority rule as stated in Federalist number 10. Uh, philosopher Rousseau uh, established a social contract where he states that if the government, um, like my colleague said, is violating the rule of law and the institution of voting, it is not um, the right, but the duty of the people to revolt against said government. And we believe that um, these revolutionary ideas that we've seen um, with uh, Henry David Thoreau's civil disobedience, and most recently with the Black Lives Matter movement, that these revolutionary ideas, when they see injustices in the government, they have standed up, stood up, and protested uh, against these injustices. In your opinion, is the amendment process in the United States Constitution too difficult? Uh, no, we would say it's not too difficult, as stated in Article 5. While it might, uh, um, while it might seem very difficult, just because uh, three fourths of the Senate would need uh, and the House would need to pass it, we believe that uh, in order for a national and a federal change to be made, and uh, it would need an incredibly arduous, it needs to be an incredibly arduous process, or else, uh, uh, or else there would not be an overwhelming. Uh, overwhelming will of the people guiding behind that. In a democratically elected republic, while in many cases we need 50% to pass a bill, uh, for, an actual amendment, uh, for an actual amendment to be passed, we believe that the 75% of uh, our Senate and our House of Representatives would be, uh, is still a good addition just because uh, federal change uh, needs to be overwhelmingly for the will of the people. Um, I disagree partially with my colleague here because I do believe that the amendment process is very difficult and there have been thousands of amendments which have not been uh, ratified and I believe that the issue of consent uh, within the people because the Constitution was written so long ago it is a living document and with changes to society and um, our civilization uh, there needs to be changes to the Constitution that rules it so I believe that Living doc that the, because the Constitution is a living document, it should be a little bit easier for the people 
of this generation to be able to impact and change the constitution that rules them? Uh, I'd like to agree with my first colleague, Vassilios. Um, French philosopher Voltaire once said, I may disapprove of what you say, but I'll defend to the death your right to say it. And, um, and that was the influence for our First Amendment and later on the Bill of Rights itself. Uh, the amendment process is created in an ar arduous and difficult way because these amendments are very important for protecting our natural rights against, against the government itself. And um, the system is long. It takes the three-fourth majority, as my colleague mentioned, because these amendments are super important. They're so important for our day-to-day -day lives, for case law, for, for anything in our Constitution. So the constitutional amendment process is arduous and difficult and the framers seem to have intended it that way so that the constitution would be amended rarely as opposed to constantly. But I'd like to go back to this idea of, um, of revolution and whether we are at a point in our government's history that, it's, that we actually are witnessing a revolution. How do you define the consent of the governed today, where with um, even where you have a candidate who wins the election, um, the, the candidate, the supporters of the candidate who did not win, um, not only are unhappy with the outcome, but talk about the declaim the election as illegitimate. You have a group of people who were so unhappy with the election, they stormed the Capitol on January 6th. And you have 33 or 34 states in this country that are putting forth legislation in the hundreds of bills in the aggregate to, as, as to quote you, undermine the sacred right of voting, which I think you said that when voting is the voting system in this is dismantled, then we see revolution. Are we seeing revolution now? And where, how do we find the consent of the government? Uh, in modern era, I do not believe that we see uh, an actual uh, time for revolution. And the reason being for this is because uh, every case involving revolution, although there's the general law, the institution of voting being brought down could uh, dismantle the system, but every case needs to be looked at uh, its facts. For example, uh, in the case of January 6th, when we had uh, rioters invade the Capitol, um, we, our group holds a stance that if there was uh, any uh, significant proof that the, that the voting process, the Electoral College, had been compromised in a significant way, then the, the right to revolution would have been had there, would have been, uh, it would have been viable. However, because there were multiple uh, or, uh, news organizations and people from both parties, such as from the Associated Press, who did not see any, uh, uh, who did not see any disruption with any voting, uh, or at least negligible the disruptions of the voting procedures, that revolution uh, was not uh, viable there. Just to go off of what my colleague just said, there was almost a seven to eight million vote gap in, in, in between the popular vote between Joe Biden and, Don, and Donald Trump. For the electoral vote gap, it would need to be about three states overturned, encompassing hundreds of thousands of votes. And if you just look at the burden of proof that that would need to have of voter fraud, it's just, it's just too much of, what, of the evidence that there is. We've also seen two recounts in Georgia and Wisconsin. We've, all, we've also seen Brad Rathenberger of Georgia and like numerous bipartisan like consensus that there was not enough fraud to overturn the election. So in that scenario, uh, as we previously stated, should be taken uh, case by case. The revolution was not justified in January 6th. To add on to what my colleague has been saying, Thomas Jefferson wrote in, uh, in the Declaration of Independence, to prove this, let facts be submitted to a candid world and proceeded to list the grievances that he had towards the crown, King George, and all the tyranny that he caused towards the colonists. We need to take each case of revolution, rebellion in that case by case basis and look at the facts. If you look at January 6th, there has been little to no evidence of there being uh, a great enough voter fraud, as my colleague mentioned, to overturn the election. However, if you look at uh, the BLM protests this summer uh, and the history behind that with Trayvon Martin, Breonna Taylor, and uh, George Floyd, you can see that there has been that evidence that that need to change the system in a way because of because of the evidence, the facts at hand. Okay, time. All right, good job. Yay. Now we're going to give the judges a little bit of time to do feedback. All right. Thank you um, for that opportunity to participate with you guys just today. Uh, 
I'm very impressed with uh, your sophistication and your understanding of the subject matter. And, and, and I'm not saying that just facetiously or, or to, to blow smoke. Uh, you guys are extremely solid. I thought across the board, both from your written and prepared statement to the question and answers. Um, anybody that mentions uh, a famous Greek like Socrates always scores well with me because I like to trace everything back to the Greeks um, because I also am Greek. Yes, <laughs> um, you must. But you you're, you covered a lot of the topic matter, the subject matters, but you also integrated it into your questions and your responses so that you, you wove this tapestry of great uh, knowledge. And I love that the participation by everyone, including disagreement. I love disagreement. Uh, and then I always, if you can slip in that, hey, the conciliatory balancing of the views approach. So uh, well done. Uh, I could go on and on, but my other colleagues would like to, to, to lavish praise on you as well, I'm sure. Thank you, Vern. First off, you guys uh, mentioned my personal favorite amendment, your opening statement, I always agree. Third Amendment, framers just nailed that. Marines have never been staying, staying in my second bedroom. Um, you know, they, they took that and just, you know, crushed it. Um, but you guys really did a nice job of walking us through um, a variety of philosophical ideas, uh, historical context, a lot of great detail, a lot of great examples. Um, in our uh, follow-up period, I really liked your distinction right off the bat of uh, violence versus revolutionary ideas. Um, in the, the conversation around the um, amendments, um, you guys did say that, you know, one of the key things about the amendment process is to protect natural rights. I don't know that the 18th Amendment saying, hey, no booze is exactly protecting natural rights, but I guess we came back and addressed that, you know, with three amendments later anyway. Um, so, you know, they're not, they're not always about that. Um, but you guys really, I think, did a nice job of walking through kind of the amendment process and being able to showcase different perspectives on that as well. And I think that's always important. Really appreciate the conversation today. Thank you. Some would say, Charlie, that the, pro the amendment prohibiting um, alcohol was your sa saving your right, your natural right to a functioning liver. But, <laughs> <laughs> but maybe we could leave that for another conversation. Well done, gentlemen, really well done. I mean, you not only did we quote you know, the ancients, but I particularly liked um, your John Adams quote. Thomas Paine is one of my favorites. Um, you know, I thought it was, I thought it was really great. And I would just echo what my colleague said. And I particularly liked, you know, how you, how you brought the conversation, the revolution of ideas into today's protest movements, Black Lives Matter, Stonewall, loved Seneca Falls. Oh, you can't go wrong there, um, in my view. Um, really well done. I thought you had a nuanced understanding of both uh, his, the historical underpinnings, uh, modern events, and, and the philosophy drawn upon by the framers and how they wove it all together. So thank you so much for a great conversation and wish you all the best in the continuing competition. Thank you. All right, good job. Thank I'm you very go much. Ahead. Thank you for your time, judges. Thank you so much for having us.